Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, while I've been asked to find a chair, I would like to, I would like you to already take your chairs uh, because we are having a scarcity of chairs. And uh, before we first congratulate those who have made this forum and this atelier possible, we would like to salute the Minister, uh, Secretary Abba, who has just joined us to honor and open this workshop on the marine protected areas, which is so important for this One Ocean Summit. And thank you, Madame la Ministre, for your support for making this One Summit happen, this One Ocean Summit happen. So while the problem of the chair is being resolved, I would like also to say that following Mrs. Abba's opening message, we would call on to Olani Willem and thank her very much for the moderation to conduct this workshop. We have 90 minutes. My humble role is to be the guardian of time. And so uh, if I have to be a bit rude, I'm sorry about that. Um, and we'll try to have a session of question and answers. So to our eminent speakers, I would like to ask you to be as concise as, as, as possible, but that will be under Olani's direction. Madame Abba, thank you. Thank you, thanks a lot. Bonjour à tous. Bienvenue à Brest, France, le centre du monde des océans. Merci. Welcome to Merci. Center of Brest. Nous nous retrouvons euh, We, après plusieurs mois de, de difficultés, de difficultés sanitaires, de difficultés économiques et environnementales, avec sans doute une prise de conscience qui n'a jamais été aussi forte. Et euh, un, moment, un, un moment particulier où les alertes scientifiques, euh, la prise de conscience et euh, l'écho politique euh, qui est faite au sujet que, que nous portons et que nous défendons euh, tous ici euh, depuis de, de de nombreuses années euh, nous donne cette opportunité euh, exceptionnelle de nous mobiliser, de nous remobiliser pour porter euh, les enjeux de préservation de, des océans, de la biodiversité qu'ils qu préservent et, euh, et toutes les solutions dont ils sont, euh, dont ils sont porteurs. Euh, nous avons cette responsabilité et euh, trois jours ici euh, à Brest pour euh, préparer les, les échéances à venir, obtenir vous le savez, euh, des engagements, un mandat, une ambition euh, dans le cadre de, de la NUE pour ce qui est des, des pollutions euh, plastiques. Euh, pour Bibi euh, nous en parlions à l'instant avec M. Le Noyer spécial de Thompson, euh, pour les, les, la haute mer et euh, beaucoup d'autres initiatives euh, sur les aires protégées qui nous amènent cet après-midi, euh, qui doivent nous amener vraiment à donner ce cadre, à le partager et à entraîner avec nous euh, le plus grand nombre de, de pays dans cette, dans cette ambition, avec des menaces que je ne vous redis pas, hein, euh, qui viennent de, de la signification, de la surpêche, des pollutions plastiques, de tous ces fléaux euh, qui voient mourir plus de 100 000 mammifères marins chaque année. Vous le savez, euh, nous avons dans la préservation de, de ces écosystèmes, euh, pas seulement un enjeu, un enjeu vital, un enjeu économique pour les, les communautés locales, euh, un enjeu climatique dans la préservation de, de ces océans et de, de leur biodiversité. Euh, nous avons également des enjeux géostratégiques avec euh, des, des réflexions à l'œuvre pour lesquelles nous devons montrer vraiment un front commun euh, en redonnant euh, leur priorité aux enjeux environnementaux. Cet équilibre, il demeure à, à construire et je crois que c'est tout euh, l'objet des réflexions que nous menons les uns et les autres sur la création, le développement, le, le, le rehaussement des ambitions des, des aires protégées. 
vous le savez, la France donc, qui vous propose cette échange et ces travaux à Brest est actuellement à la tête et exerce la présidence du Conseil de l'Union européenne. Nous, nous devions évidemment montrer en quelque sorte l'exemple et le présenter en janvier dernier la stratégie nationale pour protéger 2030, une stratégie française qui se propose de protéger 30% de nos espaces terrestres et maritimes et 10% de protection forte. Une protection forte uh, uh, sur laquelle je, je reviendrai, mais que nous avons vu euh, euh, à la française, dans ce qu'elle soit au plus haut so niveau d'ambition environnementale, mais acceptant, uh, parce qu'on a uh, constaté uh, vraiment une de, uh, uh, no de réticence à l'idée no de mise sous cloche uh, de, de réserve intégrale. Réserve intégrale qui, évidemment, uh, existe en France uh, pour uh, leur aspect uh, uh, en termes de recherche scientifique et d'observation, mais nous avons vraiment ce modèle de, de protection euh, extrêmement fort partout dans le territoire avec différents enjeux qu'il faut évidemment euh, réconcilier à chaque instant c'est toujours des enjeux avec des enjeux économiques, euh, sociaux, locaux avec euh, donc cette euh, création d'air qui doit se faire également dans le cadre international avec la coalition pour la haute ambition pour la nature et les peuples nous êtes nombreux ici Uh, and à avoir peoples, uh, endossé uh, les engagements. Nous portons, vous le savez, l'ambition de cette protection de 30% des terres et des mers of, uh, au niveau international. Nous porterons au printemps, dans le cadre des négociations de, 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 de la COP15, we'll uh, cette coalition uh, que nous avons créée il y a un an maintenant uh, est partie de 50 pays. Nous sommes aujourd'hui exactement à 83 pays qui y adhèrent. Évidemment, euh, le souhait est de l'élargir euh, plus en plus, et j'ai envie de ceux qui, dans la salle, ne sont like pas partie de cette coalition à la, à la rejoindre. Nous savons que le, le, le débat euh, dans les différents pays est toujours particulier, les contextes sont, sont différents, euh, mais nous nous joignons en écho à l'appel vraiment des scientifiques sur cette base euh, à minima de, de 30%, et donc nous nous portons avec beaucoup de, de, de ferveur. Et puis, euh, eh bien, aussi, la France a pu se, se féliciter France cette année, effectivement, euh, dans cet objectif de 30% uh, et de 10% de protection forte euh, de la création ou de l'extension de réserves naturelles nationales natural euh, ou régionales avec euh, l'archipel des Glorieuses, évidemment, avec la mer du Roise, euh, réserve dans laquelle j'ai eu le plaisir de me rendre ce matin auprès des acteurs, was, was acteurs économiques, pêcheurs, associations environnementales, uh, élus, uh, différents uh, niveaux de, de collectivité. Et on uh, le sait uh, aujourd'hui, le succès so de ces aires protégées, elles résident vraiment dans cet ancrage, dans cette gouvernance locale euh, qui permet à chacun vraiment de, de s'y engager avec le, euh, la plus grande fermeté, la plus grande ambition. Donc, je crois que nous avons cet, cet enjeu essentiel qui, euh, je ne doute pas, va, va animer beaucoup nos, nos réflexions de cet, cet après-midi. Et puis, euh, ce développement de nouvelles aires, vous le savez, euh, il doit s'entendre. Euh, Également new areas must be understood. Uh, they're interconnected. We've got to amplify and organize these ecological corridors and uh, corridors and corridors. Je crois que disposer de beaucoup de niveaux de protection et de différents modes de gestion pour ces aires protégées est essentiel parce que nous permettent de nous adapter à des contextes, à des situations locales, à la maturité des protections spécifiques aux différents territoires. Mais nous devons effectivement veiller également à ce que leur gestion soit suffisamment lisible pour permettre à chacun de s'engager et de tenir ses objectifs, avec également la nécessité d'une surveillance, d'un suivi et d'un contrôle efficace suivi d'abord de nos engagements et, et nous nous sommes appliqués au niveau national, vous and verrez au fil des jours, en mesurant in, uh, vraiment notre force et de façon aussi de marquer le plus largement possible des, des, des élus ou des acteurs dans ces, dans ces démarches et puis des contrôles et toutes les questions de, de police and évidemment, au-delà également de nos juridictions nationales, ce sera tout l'objet du traité de PNJ, cette nécessité vraiment d'encadrer des pratiques et de les contrôler avec une police de l'environnement dont je salue le travail au quotidien parce que le droit de l'environnement est un droit nouveau en France, 
se trouve dans beaucoup, beaucoup de codes et, 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 et divers textes euh, qui demandent vraiment une technicité particulière. Et je crois que nous avons également à partager ensemble sur les différentes voies pour le renforcer et le faire appliquer. Et puis au-delà des questions de droit de l'environnement, nous avons évidemment au cœur de notre action la question de la préservation des espaces et des espèces. Euh, espèces de, de, de faune et de flore, mais aussi euh, des enjeux particuliers de lutte contre les espèces exotiques envahissantes euh, qui, dans certains territoires, appellent à vraiment des, des travaux euh, mis en œuvre majeurs. Nous avons donc des, des grands défis qui, euh, so malheureusement, ne connaissent pas de frontières, qui ne sont 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 pas de frontières, que nous accueillons, nous accueillons la prochaine where, session uh, à Lyon en France de, uh, de la CITES, nous permettons de protéger le niveau international et de lutter contre ces espèces international de l'espèce. Donc aujourd'hui, cette dynamique et son sa mesure, son and, uh, contrôle, elle est largement uh, est, uh, 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 à, à la renforcer de nos expériences uh, uh, Alors, nous avons en France cette spécificité uh, uh, d'avoir uh, des enjeux sur le territoire uh, uh, métropolitain et régional et des enjeux in encore the, uh, uh, plus France. importants. And Dans also les major interest in the overseas. I would like to welcome the representative of biodiversity and who knows better than anybody else with cooperation at international uh, level with uh, neighboring states in this uh, world. We've got also specific aspects on species protection. Des, des plans nationaux d'action aux espèces euh, menacées et vulnérables. Et, et euh, nous voyons à nouveau with, euh, sur, ce, uh, sur ce travail la nécessité d'un portage uh, collectif avec tous les profils d'acteurs sur, sur un territoire. C'est vraiment je crois, la, la clé et je suis... Euh, on the same platform, and I'm very interested in your experience in the area. Avec des usages durables, des nouveaux modes de production et de consommation qui évidemment vont devoir se retrouver dans ce que les protéger nous offrent aussi comme vitrine de façons de produire et de valoriser des productions locales. Nous avons également un enjeu important à préserver à la fois les communautés locales dans leur investissement et dans ce qu'elles vivent en harmonie avec ces ressources sans les épuiser et y compris atteindre. Et également, and effectivement, en termes d'emploi de, et, et au niveau of, uh, national, jobs, effectivement, nous réfléchissons également à tout ce financement global like des aires protégées, des moyens, des aires financiers humains uh, qui leur sont nécessaires uh, dans cette montée en puissance de leur développement et de leur, uh, uh, des enjeux uh, qu'elles qu défendent, avec donc, effectivement uh, des emplois qui ont été recréés cette année dans les parcs nationaux et les parcs naturels marins. Ce sont plus de 60 emplois qui ont été recréés à cette année cet effet et une montée en puissance qui est nécessaire. Nous sommes donc en train de revoir tout le modèle de financement de la biodiversité et plus encore de l'eau et de la biodiversité puisque évidemment pour moi ça n'est qu'un seul problème. Voilà. Et tout le monde on pourrait laisser penser que je me suis un peu éloignée euh, des océans, mais comme um, vous connaissez uh, ocean, la nécessité de réfléchir à la question des océans dans ce continuum terre-mer, nous aurons uh, aussi dans les jours qui viennent de très beaux uh, exemples et échanges en la matière. Je vous remercie à tous d'être présents ici, et je vous souhaite un bon sommet. Et je vous souhaite beaucoup de sommet. while we are playing the message of opening by Lord Zach Goldsmith, Minister for Environment, uh, Government of UK. We would prepare uh, Olani uh, for the next, uh, for the introduction and the next, the next topic. I'm just waiting for my team to give me the signal for the video of Lord Zach Goldsmith. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Very good. 
sorry, black hair, but I'm going to skip. Hang on. Apologies. How do I do this? I'm going to have to have to tolerate listening. I don't, I can't think of the alternatives. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merci. Uh, and I look forward to seeing many of you in France over the next few days. So look, it, it, we, it is impossible to exaggerate the importance of our ocean, to our lives, to our economy. But globally, it's also impossible to exaggerate the damage. Now, the ocean underpins the life of hundreds of millions of people. Uh, an estimated billion people depend on fish as their main source of food, including many of the world's poorest people. And yet we're stripping the ocean with rubbish just as quickly as we're taking its resources. Over a third of marine mammals and nearly three quarters of the facing numerous threats. And the world's coral reefs are absolutely essential for so much marine life. Uh, and critical, as I saw recently on a trip to Central America, critical for protecting coastal communities. Those coral reefs will all but disappear if we fail to keep temperatures to one and a half degrees. So oceans matter for all those reasons and so much more. And while one of the most important things, probably the most important thing we can do for the ocean is to ensure we honor the Paris commitment we keep global temperatures within one and a half degrees. And that point was made so well uh, at COP26 by representatives of small island states, climate vulnerable states. But in addition to that, we also need to protect and restore marine ecosystems as a high priority. You only need to look at mangroves and corals again, in addition to their huge importance as nurseries for life. Uh, we're seeing regular reminders of the role they play in protecting coastal communities against uh, extreme weather events, the likes of which we know are only going to increase. And that's why at COP26, we took nature from the margins of the margins of the conversation on climate change, and we put it at the heart of our response, domestically and also internationally. Now, for our part in the UK, committed to doubling our international climate finance to 11.6 billion pounds, but we've also committed to spending nearly a third of that on nature and nature-based solutions, and of course that includes the ocean. And through our uh, Blue Planet Fund, which is 500 million pounds launched at the end of last year, we're supporting some of the most fragile ocean environments on Earth and the communities who rely on them, including establishing and improving marine protected areas. Now you'll have seen uh, those of you who were at COP, or even just watching COP, but were at Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama, electrified that conference when they announced that they're working together to protect over half a million square kilometers of the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And I'm delighted that the UK is supporting that grand uh, and exciting vision, because all the evidence tells us that wherever marine protection is established, ecosystems recover. We know that. And though at first such measures are often looked at with suspicion by coastal fishing communities, the evidence is also that MPAs very quickly result in greater abundance of fish stocks and therefore with greater economic security for those same communities. Indeed, where marine protected areas exist for the longest, it is often the case that local support is greatest. It's estimated that expanding marine protection by just 5% in the world's most overfished waters could improve global catches by at least 20%. So I can't think of a clearer win-win policy. But this year is full of opportunities for us to turn the tide. We have a chance in just a few weeks at UNEA to secure a new legally binding global agreement to tackle plastic pollution. I sincerely hope that that will happen. When we come together at this TBD, COP15, uh, in Kunming, we can, we must, uh, agree the protection of at least 30% of the global ocean. And we can, if the world gets its act together, establish an effective mechanism to protect areas of the two thirds of the global ocean by beyond national jurisdiction. We have, can do all three of those things if we're serious about turning the tide. But we also need to demonstrate our willingness, particularly as 
donor countries we need to show a willingness and an ability to close that huge finance gap that exists for nature and for the ocean over the next decade. But working together, I have zero doubt that we can make this the decade, that we put our ocean on a road to recovery. We have all the tools we need. The only thing that is currently lacking is sufficient political will, but I do think that's changing. So I want to thank uh, France for its ocean leadership, uh, and I really look forward to a continued work both with France, but with all of you in the coming months and years to make this a year that really counts for nature and for the open. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Thank you, Honourable Minister for the Pacific and the Environment for joining us from London. I would like to take you with the permission of uh, Olani to Denmark with uh, the Minister uh, Lea Vermelin, uh, uh, Minister for Environment, who is also with us, I'm told, in a visio, uh, before Olani takes the floor. Everyone from sunny uh, Copenhagen. I think there's a little bit of echo on the line. It's fine, it's fine. It's fine? Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished uh, guests, for giving Denmark the opportunity to contribute to this important One Ocean Summit. As a country surrounded by the sea, one of Denmark's key priorities is protecting the marine environment. And right now, as it was just stated, our oceans, the largest ecosystem of our planet, are under immense pressure. We face loss of biodiversity, plastic pollution, and the ever-growing threats from climate change. So there is no wavering or uncertainty when it comes to the facts and the science. If we want to heal our oceans, we need to act now. This is not an easy task, but it is mandatory. Many of the challenges facing our oceans are interlinked and therefore many solutions can be as well. In Denmark, we believe that nature-based solutions are key. And therefore, we support the target of protecting 30% of marine areas. And we stand behind the Global 30 by 30 initiative that sets our planet on track to protect at least 30% of our oceans by 2030. In cooperation with the Global Ocean Alliance, Blue Leaders and the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. And internationally, Denmark also seeks the conclusion of an ambitious legally binding instrument and an instrument that should help advance the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Here we find it crucial that all countries commit to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular SDG 14, which underlines the need to protect and conserve marine and coastal ecosystems from pollution. As I've said it before, we need to act to heal our oceans, and this year we have a unique opportunity to make an everlasting change. One of the threats facing our oceans is the surge in plastic pollution. Our largest ecosystem is no longer only the home of corals and whales. It has also become a global conveyor belt of empty bottles and plastic bags. This is a threat to our wildlife, to deep seabirds and sea turtles, and enhance the health of people living in poverty. But in a few weeks, as my colleague also stated, at UNEA 5, we have the opportunity to adopt a resolution to convene an internationally negotiating committee under the auspices of UNEA, and with the mandate to prepare an internationally legally binding instrument to address plastic pollution. We have started discussions on combating marine litter years ago. Now we need to keep this momentum going and act on the current political will to combat marine litter globally. We therefore strongly support adoption of the resolution and we believe that convening the inter uh, Intergovernmental Committee will be a crucial starting point on a journey that will lead to a plastic-free ocean. 
Our oceans are under pressure and the world is waiting for all of us to act. So now is the time to make the necessary decisions and protect our oceans for the future by making strong commitments at UNIA 5 and at the COP. And therefore, I also really want to thank uh, France and Berenger for, together with us, putting this on the agenda. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Olani, the floor is now definitely yours. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Bonjour. Good afternoon. Aloha. I'm Aulani Wilhelm. I'm from the Hawaiian Islands. I have the privilege of working at Conservation International, um, running our Global Oceans Program. Thank you so much from all the ministers for those really clear, impassioned, um, and wonderful remarks that really show the growing consensus among leaders of, of very important countries. And we're really honored to have another minister here with us. And before we start our panels, I would really like to take the opportunity to have her join the stage and share with us Madame Arlette Soudan Nonon, who's the Minister of Environment for Sustainable Development and the Congo Basin from the Republic of Congo. Please join us here. And thank you for your leadership. Bonsoir à tous. Je vois que je suis la seule qui vienne pratiquement de, du Sud, ici dans cette salle, comme je ne sais pas s'il y en a d'autres. Je suis effectivement la ministre de l'Environnement, du Développement Durable et du Bassin du Congo. Mais le Bassin du Congo, pour ceux qui ne nous connaissent pas, C'est le second poumon écologique de la planète. Well, uh, the Congo Basin, the second uh, ecological lung of the planet, it's a, a huge et carbon reservoir, and it is not really well known. I'm in charge of coordinating the 16 countries ce poumon écologique depuis who have been carrying this ecological lung for five years. The president of the Republic of Congo, uh, Mr. Sassou Nguesso, is heading what we call the uh, Climate Commission of the Congo Basin, which is an institution, an agency of the African Union, and I'm the coordinator on behalf of the 16 member states. Of course, uh, we have uh, uh, projects, we have an investment uh, fund, we have a trust fund, which is called the Blue fund for the basin development. Let me go back to our One Planet Ocean Summit. Je terminerai par là peut-être 10%. I could say that the Congo Basin is some 10% of global biodiversity, and that is not insignificant. How come are we about to become one of the lungs of the planet? Because, well, you, we're all aware of the Congo Basin forests, uh, which capture no less than 1.5 billion tons of CO2. This is a well-known fact. But uh, uh, with Leeds University in the UK, uh, discovery was made uh, recently. And I was uh, discussing, uh, I was, I was uh, uh, listening to our colleague, uh, Zach Goldsmith, and discussed a lot with him before the Glasgow, Glasgow uh, uh, COP. So together, we share what we called uh, the uh, peat. Uh, areas in the Congo Basin, which capture uh, some 31 billion tons of CO2, so uh, 1.5 for forests, but peat land is 31 billion tons of capture CO2 capture. Uh, as ICCP uh, has been mentioning, but uh, the rest of the planet doesn't seem to be really aware of that. That amounts to something like three or four years' worth of greenhouse emission, something like 15 to 20 years from the, of the U.S. Uh, greenhouse uh, emission. Je suis également à la tête now, de I know la we're talking about oceans here, but I'm also, uh, I'm also chairing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the management of the uh, uh, Abidjan Corp, which is in charge of the entire Gulf of Guinea, some 12 countries who've been coordinating uh, in the past years. Also, I wear another hat, which is the Minister of Environment, 
the hut. Hein, for the rest of Africa, for the 54 African countries, uh, which make up the African Union, COP we, we uh, uh, chair what we call the Bamako COP on the prohibition of the import des, uh, of, des sachets, des, of des harmful hazardous waste. Mon pays, and the management of a harmful waste such as plastic. My country, the Republic of Congo, has had a law for the past 20 des, years des uh, regarding the prohibition of hazardous waste uh, or uh, harmful waste such as plastic, but very often we fall victim to what comes from the outside, de, really. Uh, and our country has a, a shoreline on the Atlantic of Chang, which is 170 kilometers long. Ici. And that explains why we're here today. De, de notre pays. Et là, nous sommes régulièrement euh, so, bousculés un peu line, par les questions de, de fortes érosions côtières, by, uh, les entrées d'eau salée dans nos terres, qui menacent le naf phréatique, uh, donc uh, les ressources en eau potable, uh, in, de l'irrigation uh, et les risques uh, de submersion uh, marine et d'inondation. Il y a également un littoral qui est exposé aux pollutions liées à l'exploitation pétrolière offshore, uh, oil uh, drilling facilities, uh, and which may have a, a serious impact on mangrove. Mangrove is a very fragile coastal uh, ecosystem. And mangrove also captures de uh, des some 200% of the forest biomass, mm, just as a peatland, really. Si nous ne pas so attention, if we are not careful, these ecosystems uh, menaces, uh, will be extremely threatened uh, and endangered. And uh, uh, these uh, have a, a, a strategic ce, ce role to play et ce uh, with the framework of the Congo Basin which is the, one Donc, of the lungs of our planet la and a great Congo uh, carbon uh, la préservation uh, de capture sa mechanism. Dans son appareil so we have in Congo Mais integrated que the management of coastal zones within ici. our ecological uh, savez, nous avons system. Tous no, what is the message I wish to complete? We've all gone to various summits. Une démarche un peu I've been doing that for about five years. I think nous we tend to stick to nous statements, annonçons. declarations. We announce, Mais we declare, we stand. But we do not really Glasgow seem to be able to materialize uh, anything. Uh, and I must say that in this une, respect, nous avons beaucoup déchanté. Uh, Glasgow uh, was very disappointing. Uh, Since Copenhagen in 1992, the Paris Agreement in 2015, which gave us a general structure uh, for what can be done uh, on the, on the climate nous nous front, avec un front. Uh, we've salle. attended all the uh, terrain, cops, cela, uh, but uh, nous, between what we hear at the conference and what we see on the ground, uh, there's, there's a great difference. Uh, Once the show is over, nothing seems to be planet, uh, happening, and I think we're a bit Donc idealistic, si and we tend to forget that we only have one planet. Droit. De so even if de we, the, the thing is, if si we don't manage to harmonize our dans, uh, environmental law at the global eh ben, level, vous aurez uh, que I'm les terribly pays sorry, sont but boulet, you may have the feeling that some countries are a burden for northern countries, but I'm afraid that is not true. It's quite the other way around. We are a biodiversity, a reservoir for biodiversity. We are a a great reservoir of fish resources, we are uh, the land of the, of the planet, territoires, les ressources naturelles. but sans pour autant souvent the se problem mettre is, à la place des populations et des peuples qui, qui qui sometimes uh, you find it difficult to uh, put yourself uh, in the footsteps, as one said, I didn't go to Brazzaville. Venir vous faire une diplomatie from Brazzaville, I didn't come from Brazzaville to, to, to do a sort of, uh, you know, to, to speak conventional diplomatic uh, uh, jargon. Excuse me, and thank you for your support, for your applause. I appreciate that. So, excuse me, it's so important for us. We're running out of time. We do not have time just to make agir. statements, declarations, what have you. We maintenant. need to act, and we need voilà. to act now. Vous inquiétez pas, vous inquiétez pas. Je... Et, et surtout à l'atelier qui suit. Vous inquiétez pas. Let us not forget the moderator is saying, let us not forget that there is a workshop
up. Coming up. Si vous gardez la parole, je vais perdre, on va perdre du temps. C'est vous qui voyez, on va perdre du temps. C'est vous qui voyez. Donc je disais tout simplement qu'il nous faut gagner, gagner du temps. Que au-delà donc de, de ce que j'aurais pu vous lister. Toute la législation que nous avons dans mon pays, bien entendu, uh, uh, sur la protection de la diversité, nous allons aller à Tunis, comme nous avons été également en Égypte et autres, sous la gestion des risques des catastrophes, la lutte contre les crimes environnementaux de toute nature, tout ce que vous voulez, oui. mais je terminerai peut-être par... Uh, euh, ce que l'Union africaine fait, en vous disant que ce n'est pas un hasard, si cette tragédie qui est reprise par l'Union africaine pour les océans c'est-à-dire a été, euh, euh, au niveau de l'Union africaine, il y a un accent particulier dans l'agenda 2063 qui a été mis sur les océans et les mers. Et j'aimerais peut-être reprendre une citation, je terminerai par là, pour ne pas abuser du temps qui est accordé, en disant « À la mémoire de tous ceux qui ont péri en mer, à la recherche du vie meilleure, aient perdu leur vie dans les océans, pendant la traite négrière, la colonisation et la lutte pour l'indépendance de l'Afrique. » Je vais Slave conclure trade. par là en disant que Some people cette were fighting for the que je vous rappelle ici si sans doute que la survie de so ce des océans, j'aimerais conclure par là, and I would really se like joue, se joue tout d'abord sur terre, sur terre, au centre sur terre, c'est d'abord nous really, les humains qui dégradons I mean, we et qui are apportons the ones, également cette dégradation sur les océans. Je vous remercie. Let us not forget that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. So you wouldn't be here at the One Ocean Summit in this session if you didn't already understand that we live on an ocean planet and that all living systems on Earth really depend and are driven by the ocean. So simply put, if we want to stabilize the planet, we have to stabilize the ocean. And marine protected areas, area-based conservation, are a really important part of doing that. And that's really what this session is about. We're talking about why MPAs, for whom, and for what. And so to open this session, we have Dr. Dr. Susan Gardner, the director of the Ecosystems Division at UNEP. And she's joined by Leticia Carvalho. Would you like to join here? to say also a few words when she's finished. Okay, and I think she's by live video. So our wonderful tech support. Welcome, Dr. Gardner. Thank you so much. It's the enormous pleasure to be able to share some comments now as part of, uh, as part of this. I'm so sorry not to be there in person. I need to be here in Nairobi, as many of you have referenced the important negotiation that's coming uh, for UNEA. And uh, we have many of us here in the Secretariat that are watching it very closely. Excuse me as I resolve my technical issues. So our oceans, as many have mentioned, is truly the engine of all life. And it is very difficult to speak after the powerful statements of the ministers. The ocean stands at the nexus of our triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. And we're aware of the tremendous, tremendous uh, impacts and effects and intense pressure that the oceans are under from things like fisheries, from things like um, pollution, including plastic pollution. And plus the warming and the chemical changes that are occurring in the ocean that disrupt the food systems, that disrupt food webs that then also have a ripple effect across ecosystems and those functions that ecosystems provide for people. But our oceans also holds the solution and it's a massive resource for sustainable development. We know that 44% of the world's population lives within 150 miles of the ocean. And we know that one in 10 people rely on marine fisheries and aquaculture for their livelihoods. Ocean also provides climate mitigation and resilience that is, benefits every day. 
up to 10 times more carbon is stored in coastal habitats than even in tropical forests if you look at it on a per unit area basis. And nature-based solutions do include protecting marine ecosystems. They can provide up to 37% of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that's needed to stabilize warming to two degrees by 2030. MPAs are a powerful nature-based solution. They carry a potential that's immense. They can reconcile biodiversity, climate, and fisheries management objectives. And they can have a mutual benefit for many shared interests, including sustainable development goals. But let's be clear, the number of protected areas alone isn't what unlocks the potential of dynamic ecosystems. It's really strengthening the quality, the equitability, and the governance of marine protected areas, both those that are currently existing and those that are coming forth. Where we stand right now with marine protected areas is we have almost 28 million square kilometers. That's about 8% of oceans that are currently documented within some kind of protected or conservation area. And there has been considerable progress in covering, expanding coverage of marine protected areas. But we do also know, as other ministers have said before me, that a healthy, productive, resilient marine environment needs at least 30% of the world's ocean to be safeguarded. And performance is really key. The UNEP has some practical experience working with uh, governance arrangements that we can see can form a great blueprint for action. Combining roles of government, local stakeholders, the private sector is particularly important in terms of improving MPA and performance. For example, in Jamaica, there's a community-led Bluefields Bay Marine Protected Area that's especially effective because it involved all the relevant stakeholders from the beginning in the design. It includes financial independence for supporting itself in the local community, and it enabled governments to be at the heart of enforcement of regulations. This is the kind of result that is thriving and successful for a marine protected area, and that can serve as a blueprint ready to be scaled up. So I would like to leave you with three things. The first is let's work together to increase marine protected areas, quantity as well as quality and to strengthen effectiveness. We can do this and we can deliver outcomes for nature and people. Second, our ambitions for nature have to be matched by nature positive investments, including domestic, international, public, as well as private sources. By 2030, investments on nature-based solutions need to at least be tripled. And third, science and innovation are key to delivering on the anticipated global biodiversity framework and the Paris Agreement. The UN Ocean Decade on Science for Sustainable Development creates conditions for this, in addition to being coupled with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So in closing, I'd just like to say that as countries are negotiating a new and ambitious global biodiversity framework and coming together as well at the UN Environment Assembly to talk about a future INC on plastic pollution and marine litter, there's so much that we can learn from each other to take stock from past experiences. And we need all hands on deck. I'm looking forward very much to the rich and insightful conversations in this action-filled summit for people and for the planet. Thank you. Excellencies, ministers, colleagues, uh, as I build upon the reflections of UNAP's Director of Ecosystem, Susan Gardner, I would like to reiterate the unparalleled importance of marine protected areas in maintaining and advancing a healthy ocean for people, planet, and yes, profits from local livelihoods to global supply chains. But to continue to draw vital resources from marine ecosystems, our overall ambition must be for a 100% sustainably managed ocean. 
with the 30 percent, 30 by 30 percent target as the engine for ocean replenishment. MPAs give the ocean room to breathe, reproduce, and be plentiful. With the leaps and bounds we have made in science and technology, we have never been in a better position to act. With monitoring, transparency, and accountability at the heart of our decision making. As we are all aware, very aware, we never been at a loss for our well-being commitments. Well-meaning commitments, apologies. We have seen decades come and go with unmet 2020 IT targets and SDG targets. We take stock and start over, often in disconnected silos. The, the post-2020 biodiversity framework and the deeper integration of ocean considerations internationally determined contributions provide huge opportunities to apply our knowledge and know-how and to show that we have to, the collective will many times spoken in previous workshops today, to join hands across sectors, industry, ministries, and geographies to make peace with nature for our future generations. I again reiterate the invitation and encouragement to all of the ocean community to look at, at UNEA 5.2 uh, decisions in the end of this month, as, the, as there is a lot at stake there. We are in the eve of a new global agreement that can, for the first time, acknowledge the linkages, the nexus between the way we produce and consume our land with what happened and the fate of our ocean. I really encourage this community to take a look and keep an eye in the decisions there. Thank you very much. As you can see, this is a popular session, not just to attend, but lots to say and not enough time to say it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna minimize my role here and lay it out. We have two topics to talk about today and some wonderful speakers to share. And really we've asked them to briefly look at recommendations that we can deliver for Friday and beyond. And we're gonna have some wonderful calls to action as well. So we're gonna go a bit rapid fire here and they're, these are all experts in this field. This is the topic we love to speak about and think about every day. So look up their bios. I'm just gonna briefly introduce them and their current role. They have much more behind them. So please do that as well, but I thought we would leave time to actually focus. So our first topic is on securing MPA benefits for both people and nature. You know, I've worked in this uh, space for over 20 years, but bef you know, before joining Conservation International, I led the effort to protect what is now Papahanao Mokuakea, one of the largest marine protected areas on the planet. It really was a forerunner. We had no idea what we were doing, no idea how to do it, and I've really seen this field grow, and I've been really pleased, and I'm actually encouraged, despite the dire situation that our planet is facing, we've seen great changes in marine protected areas, going from a focus on species and maybe habitats to now really realizing what we've already heard. Like people and the engagement of people are essential, right? We can't do this without equitable engagement, inclusion, and benefit sharing throughout. And not just words, but really in practice. Because the MPA that I had helped to lead is now 21 years old. And the reason that it is proving to still continue to be successful is because people are engaged and over generation. And it's, it's always a work in progress. It always takes work. It is never done. So in that, I'd like to dig in and I'd like to offer, uh, ask Dr. Joaquim Claudet, who is a senior scientist at the National Center for Scientific Research here in France, to really focus on you know, what the ecological, social, and economic outcomes of MPAs are. And really, what are the conditions that help that be so? Please. Thank you, Thank you Arlene. Uh, um, bonjour à tous. Uh, I will try to bring in the voice of, of science uh, around the table and, and to speak only about scientific evidence. So what does science tell us uh, about that? First, it shows that uh, in case of overfishing, uh, spatial management is more optimal than non-spatial management. And among the spatial management tools, marine protected areas are those that can contribute to the larger extent to the many indicators of SDG 14. 
And why that is because MPAs, they can deliver, as you've just said, ecological, but also social and economic benefits. In marine protected areas, uh, habitats can be restored. Uh, in marine protected areas, animals can grow bigger. Uh, their reproductive output is larger, so they are more abundant. And in marine protected areas, science shows that once those uh, animals and especially fish are more abundant inside the MPA, they can spill over, they can go out of the MPA, and they can contribute to larger fish catch, and they can contribute to larger income for fishers. Uh, and this is because of this demonstrated benefit that many countries agreed to increase the number of marine protected areas worldwide and to use marine protected areas to contribute to SDG. Uh, however, uh, something important is that the MPA that were studied, all the scientific evidence were based on a given type of MPA which are fully protected, so no take areas. And all, most of the MPAs that were then established were not like that. So then what did scientists do? They came, they go, and they studied all those MPAs. And unfortunately, what we've discovered is that MPAs that are not fully or highly protected, they cannot deliver ecological and socioeconomic benefits. And if they can, it's in a much, much lower extent than fully protected areas. And so there is a kind of, uh, of misconception that there is a trade-off between protecting, protecting the environment or deriving socioeconomic benefits. And this is really a wrong conception of things. We do need to protect the environment to extract socioeconomic benefit from the environment. We need to do both. It's not conservation or sustainable development. Conservation is part of sustainable development. There is no sustainable development without conservation. So it is very important to increase the level of protection in the existing MPAs, and we, we do need to protect the ocean to, to protect ourselves. Thank you, Joachim. So there is no sustainable development without conservation. That's the tagline, and that's what we need to remember. So Tundi, you've been in this business for a long time. What makes this work? Far too long. <laughs> um, bonjour. So, oh, sorry, Dr. Agardi is the founder of Sound Seas. I apologize. Uh, no worries. Thank you, Alani. So we know and we've heard that MPAs that are strategically designed and that are effectively managed, both have to be true, are a hugely powerful tool to heal the ocean. We know that. That's why we're here to talk about this. That's why we're here to push countries to go further. Um, not only to make their existing commitments, but to be ambitious and make even more ambitious commitments. We know that MPAs can be refuges for biodiversity, um, but in addition, MPAs can do other things. And I just want to mention a few of those things. One is that they often provide ways to empower local communities, local users in decision making, and therefore really foster stewardship. Uh, it's an important point, I think, as we look for ways to uh, do what Alani said in the beginning, which was to more effectively engage and, uh, M people in MPAs, but also look for equitable benefits flowing out of MPAs. That kind of engagement with um, people and empowering them to take their decision-making into their own hands um, is important, where appropriate and where needed. Another thing that MPAs do, which isn't talked about very much, um, is to pro provide um, demonstrations, living demonstrations, and really proof of concept, proving ground, for how to integrate management across sectors. So many MPAs will be multiple use MPAs, will have within them very stri strictly protected no-take areas that are delivering um, biodiversity benefits. Uh, but also will be integrating other sectors in such a way that really if we could achieve what is done in MPAs in terms of integration across the whole ocean, we would really not need MPAs anymore. 
Um, so these benefits are true, but only, again, if MPAs are designed and managed in such a way that they're fit, fit for purpose. What we protect, where we protect it, and how we protect it does matter, um, as Joachim said. It really makes no sense whatsoever to think about a conservation agenda separate um, from a sustainable use agenda, or to think about conservation as somehow separate from the thing that all countries aspire to, which is a healthy, thriving blue economy. Nor does it really make sense for us to obsess too much about the targets, the numbers, um, although it, they're useful in terms of being able to track and see if people are, uh, countries are keeping to their commitments. Um, what really matters is less whether it's 10%, 20%, 30%. What matters is um, whether we can use MPAs to their fullest potential to get 100% of the ocean well managed or our impacts on the ocean minimized um, and ocean health recovered. So I make three recommendations. Alani asked us to focus on action items. Um, one is to plan MPAs holistically, to really think about what's needed in terms of a strategic approach, to maintain connections. And by connections, I mean connections between different kinds of biomes, connections between land, water, fresh water, and sea. Uh, thinking about the ways that life on Earth is interconnected, so maintaining those connections, but also, importantly, maintaining connections between humans and nature, and really building those connections, making them stronger. Um, secondly, to invest in effective management, truly effective management. Not management that looks good on paper but is not taking place, but actually uh, effective management that makes creates demonstrable um, outcomes. And sometimes this is going to be co-management. Sometimes this is going to be a decentralization of management or looking for ways to work with communities and users to effectively manage. And then thirdly, to take steps not only to um, conserve the nature that we have remaining in the ocean, but also to look for ways to restore to really take advantage of the UN decade of um, ecosystem restoration and use MPAs effectively to start the healing process. So I would say do all three of these things within the sphere of marine spatial planning. Don't think about MPA planning as somehow separate from marine spatial planning that is delivering um, the blue economy for us all. So do that in concert with um, broader planning, not just in national jurisdictions, but in the high seas beyond as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tundi. You can hear the practical uh, recommendations, and I really always rely on her for that, and that comes from the School of Hard Knocks for sure, and practice, so thank you. And it's really my absolute privilege to introduce our next uh, speaker, the Honorable Maina Sage, who is a member of parliament representing French Polynesia in the French National Assembly. Um, as, a, as a fellow Polynesian, it's just great pride to have you be here and to share. So can you please talk about your experiences and, and really the, the role of people, but also the role that oceans can play in economic recovery? Thank you all, Olani. Uh, hello to everyone. Bonjour à tous. Et merci de, de votre accueil ici. Merci de votre invitation. Et je suis très honorée d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui. Uh, je vais continuer en français. I will speak in French. Uh, juste pour partager avec I'm vous uh, quelques, quelques points de solutions pour uh, finalement uh, aller plus loin et faire en sorte que les projets que nous avons, nos objectifs, just wanted to share a few solutions uh, uh, to make sure that our floating area projects do work. We all agree on how important is the ocean. We all agree that there are threats today. We've been discussing them over fishing, pollution, guest of resource, and also uh, pollution on the coastline, and also the uh, uh, demographic increase on uh, the coast. And we all agree on the 
2030 objectives. So there is, there is a will at global scale. It has been expressed both by populations and stakeholders. The problem is how to achieve the goals and how we can uh, really assess uh, the achievements. So, of course, we have to harmonize our approach and we have to see not only what we do, but how we do it, i.e. quality is important. Let me share with you the various meetings I had with uh, PMA managers and directors. Because what I want to say is that beyond human financial means, even though that is very important, you need an inclusive approach. What I managed to see is that it works when you work in an inclusive fashion. So the problem is how do you do it? So let me uh, mention four types of projects which may supplement each other and which together may help us to go faster and further along to uh, comply with the requirements. First of all, we should not forget the relationship, the link between earth and sea, and I'd go even beyond that. Land, sea, and high sea. When you start assessing coastal areas, you need, of course, to take into account what is actually happening on the coastlines, who lives there, what is the history of such territories, what is the type of population uh, living there and, 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 and taking care of the area. Now, point number two. Of course, at the national level, we will establish goals, a framework, regulations. And here again, I really wish to thank the French government for its engagement. Uh, maybe we do not mention it enough, and maybe people don't really know uh, that uh, well enough. Uh, France is not only uh, a significant to you, continental Europe, uh, countries. Uh, France uh, is present all over uh, the planet because it has like a dozen overseas territory and 97 percent of the French uh, maritime space is located overseas and two-thirds of this is in the Pacific where I come from. So maybe this is why w w we have this type of sensitivity and I really want to pay a tribute to our Polynesian uh, Minister for Environment and Culture because he is here today, too. So, for me, the French commitment is very important. Uh, France has the second uh, maritime uh, domain, and also that entails a responsibility. We need to show the way. We need to be examples. So we have a national framework uh, to get the job done, but uh, I think we need a very good connection between the local level and the national level. We have to leave enough leeway at the local level so that people at that level uh, can take decisions and adjust decisions to uh, what is happening on the ground. Otherwise, we will be faced with reluctances, as always. And also, we have to really be clear as to the relationship between the private and the public uh, sector. Of course, the local public domain must, must be in, in, in constant relationship with, with, with the private sector, not only private companies, but also associations and so on and so forth, and civil society organizations. So, there, there's a need for a very strong partnership between the public and the private sector. And to conclude, I'd like to say a few terms about something that we are quite sensitive about in the Pacific. We hear a lot about solutions based on nature, but in the Pacific, we're talking also about solutions based on uh, culture. I think Adnan Tamotapu is a good example of that because he's minister of both the environment and culture. And that goes to show to what extent for us it is really closely interrelated in our uh, traditional uh, culture. We have uh, marine areas which are called rare, We try to protect them all over the Pacific. There are some in Hawaii. The entire Polynesian Pacific is, uh, has that. And we can see the difference when you protect areas. Uh, 
the population accepts that kind of project much more easily when they are related to our own traditional heritage, to the way we relate to our ancestors, our forebearers, which means that the, the link is stronger and is more easily transmitted. So the other few words I would share with you, first, the relation between the land, you know, the sea and the deep sea, uh, the high sea, because you can't protect the shoreline and then do whatever you want uh, in the high sea that would not be consistent. And also, the second point, the link between private and public, and the third link, the uh, link between uh, ocean, nature, on the one hand, and culture. And we want this to really promote sustainable development and be at the very heart of local territorial projects. These projects can be markers of our resilience, of the resilience of our territories. Especially after the pandemic, we need, uh, we, we need a new outlook. Uh, we we need to to to, to make ecological transition um, more effective. We, we would like to to turn all these projects into markers of our ecological and economic resilience in our territories. There's so many things there, but really these pairings: land, sea, people. Uh, nature, culture, nature, and really islands are the place where all these things play out for island earth. So there's so many lessons to be gained from, I'm biased clearly, but there are so many lessons to be gained from islands and the situation that can really carry forward to better, making better decisions about the planet. So let's move from talking about engagement in with communities as durable solutions to talk about governments here. So. Um, we have Remy Parmentier, I'm sorry, terrible French, um, director of the Varda Group, to now share what are some ways, what are some ways to incentivize governments? Thank you, Olani. I know that you like to hear your name with, uh, with the French accent, so merci, Olani. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts uh, which result from uh, my f four decades of experience in ocean advocacy. Uh, you can find uh, more details if you Google the words Brest wishes for the ocean in 2022. Uh, this is the title of an article I wrote, which was published a couple of, week of weeks ago in New York. I welcome, of course, like everybody, the efforts to uh, achieve 30% of ocean protection by 2030, even if there are uh, still uncertainties as to uh, whether and when the uh, parties to the CBD uh, will be able to endorse uh, this target, uh, let alone what is meant uh, by the word protection. But I propose that we uh, focus now uh, on the other 70%. I think it is time to make ocean protection the norm rather than the exception. This could be achieved by reversing the burden of proof rather than forcing ocean advocates to demonstrate that protection is feasible. Ocean users would have to demonstrate that their activities are safe or that adequate mitigation measures are in place to prevent irreversible environmental damage. Environmental impact assessments, such as those that are envisaged in the draft BBNJ uh, agreement, would thus have clout because that would condition the choices governments make when licensing ocean resources and seascape exploitation. We would designate and manage marine exploitable areas. And what is outside of these areas would by definition be protected. It would be a very effective manner to uh, put the precautionary principle into practice. The uh, celebration uh, last year of the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the 1991, uh, in 1991, of the Madrid Protocol, whereby the entire Antarctic 
continent was turned into a nature reserve served as a reminder that thinking out of the box is a necessity when technical discussions are stuck, for example, as it is the case at the moment in Kamlar with regard to Antarctic MPAs. It was uh, there, I was there in uh, 30 years ago, um, and I can tell you that uh, it was uh, that if we had pursued business as usual 30 years ago, the Antarctic continent would never have been protected and mining companies, mining companies would be most probably uh, drilling for oil and other minerals there now on the Antarctic continent. And talking of mining, there are obvious analogies between what happened three decades ago when uh, there was a deliberate attempt to open the door to minerals exploitation in Antarctica, which we were able to defeat, and the draft mining code, which is now under consideration by the UN International Seabed Authority, and which, if not challenged, would give the green light to uh, deep sea mining operations. And I am an optimist. So I hope that this week, here in Brest, President Macron can join the campaign to protect the ocean from uh, deep sea mining. Thank you very much. <laughs> Remy, everything sounds better with a French accent. But those provocative words, let everybody sit with that. This is where things get us spicy. Um, and imagine where we actually took some of these tools and rethink some of our, our notions. And that's what I think you're challenging us to do right now. So we ask a lot from the ocean, and we need the ocean to do more, right? We keep asking despite the stress that we've placed on it. But now we're asking, what is the role of oceans in climate change? So we're going to switch to our remote video to ask Lauren Wenzel, the director of NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center, to join us remotely. Is Lauren here? Yeah. Hello, Alani, can you hear me? We can hear you and we hope to see, there you are. Awesome, go ahead, Lauren, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this important discussion today. We're all aware that the ocean plays a pivotal role in the car carbon cycle and is bearing the brunt of climate impacts. Our ocean has absorbed over 90% of the excess heat from rising greenhouse gas emissions and over 30% of our carbon dioxide emissions, resulting in widespread damage to marine ecosystems through warming and acidification. But encouragingly, we are seeing real progress in connecting ocean and climate action. The Climate COP25 hosted by Chile was the first blue COP with a focus on the role of the ocean in climate solutions. This theme was carried forward at COP26 last November in Glasgow, where the final decision emphasized the protection, conservation, and restoration of terrestrial and marine ecosystems in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The final decision also invites the UNFCCC work programs to integrate and strengthen ocean-based actions into their work plans. This is an important step to recognize the critical links between the ocean, climate, and biodiversity, and the need to address them jointly in international climate and biodiversity processes. As part of this growing recognition of the ocean, marine protected areas are increasingly acknowledged as a key tool in both mitigating climate impacts and advancing climate adaptation. By protecting and restoring carbon storing habitats and processes, such as mangroves, salt marshes, seagrasses, and kelp, MPAs preserve vital reservoirs that keep carbon out of the atmosphere while providing a host of other benefits. MPAs can also prevent the disturbance of bottom sediments from activities like trawling, helping to ensure that carbon remains stored over the long term. MPAs advance adaptation by shielding vulnerable shorelines, protecting climate refugia, and reducing non-climate stressors to support healthier, more resilient species and habitats. But MPAs need to be strengthened to fulfill their potential. I think this is a theme we're hearing from this panel. First, MPAs need to be more highly protected in order to deliver a full suite of climate benefits, 
including healthier marine ecosystems that store carbon in marine life and ocean sediments. As others have said, we need to decarbonize the atmosphere by recarbonizing the biosphere. Second, we need to get serious about designing not just individual MPAs, but functional MPA networks. MPA networks can help species and habitats adapt by providing safe landing spaces as they move due to climate pressures and protect climate refugia, areas that change more slowly and allow more time for adaptation. MPAs can also be complemented by dynamic area-based measures that are more quickly responsive in addressing climate impacts. And finally, MPA networks need to represent the full diversity of marine ecosystems and not only be established in areas where they are easier to establish. Third, we need to support the integration of climate into all aspects of MPA management, from regulations to outreach to monitoring and green operations. And finally, I'd like to urge participants to embrace an ambitious vision for more protected and effective MPA networks that will advance our climate, biodiversity, and community and sustainability goals. And lastly, Alani, I just wanted to mention that Dr. Jane Lubchenco is having some connectivity problems with this platform. And I'm, uh, she has asked if I could at, read her remarks when you come to her in the agenda. So I'm happy to do that if, if requested. Thanks. Thanks for that, Lauren. Well, we've heard so much. Thank you, Lauren. I don't know if my, can you hear me? My microphone? Yes. No longer on. Okay, thank you, Lauren for that. Um, hang with us. I know it's the afternoon. We have a lot of speakers, but we have a lot of wonderful things ahead. And so to close out this first topic, we just want to do that with a call to action. So I want to invite Masha Kalininiya <laughs> to come up here. And I'm not going to take any time. Just take it away. Perfect. No, my, my pleasure. Um, yes, my name is Masha Kalinina. And um, although I work for the Pew Charitable Trust, I am here on behalf of a new partnership known as Enduring Earth. So remember that name. Um, hopefully you'll be hearing it a lot. So when I time my remarks, they're a little bit over three minutes, so bear with me. Uh, my family is actually from Russia. I was born and raised there despite my deceptive American accent. And uh, they're from a tiny village outside of Moscow called Ilinsky Pagost. So if they're watching, no, they're not watching. Um, and my childhood, I spent, <laughs> I spent picking mushrooms with my grandmother in their community forest. And um, mushrooms can actually be very dangerous to human life, if you guys <laughs> don't know that. And it was remarkable to see her, based on her ancestral knowledge, know exactly what should be picked so we don't die and what to leave behind for nature. And I just like this as an example, very small one, of living in harmony with nature, which gets me to my remarks. So what I want to talk about today is how effective and lasting conservation can, provoke, can promote living in harmony with nature and benefit biodiversity and livelihoods. This is the aspiration that guides enduring Earth, a new global collaboration between the Nature Conservancy, the Pew Charitable Trusts, World Wildlife Fund, Zoma Lab, and the office of Ben and Lucy Anna Walton. The goal of Enduring Earth is to accelerate ocean, land, and freshwater conservation worldwide to help address the climate and biodiversity crises. When it launches in April, we will accomplish this through broad-based partnerships, permanent funding, and local leadership utilizing an approach called Project Finance for Permanence, PFP. Remember that too. It is a proven model that fully funds conservation projects to ensure durable and scalable impact. We know this model can work for MPAs because it's already working in Costa Rica, where one of the first PFPs was created in 2010. It's called Forever Costa Rica. And for the past 10 years, it helped unlock public and private funding to double the size of the country's marine protected areas and directly benefit over 400 communities. PFPs has all, have also been deployed in Bhutan, Peru, Brazil, and Canada, mobilizing over $1.5 billion to permanently fund protected areas um, now twice the size of California. 
Our vision is to extend this model to a further 20 countries and additional marine protected areas over the next decade in order to conserve half a billion hectares by 2030. So we will secure at least two billion from philanthropic and public funders over the next five years to leverage more than four billion by 2030. We've already secured $400 million in pledges. I mean, it's incredible. And we have Carlos Manuel, I believe, speaking later today uh, from the Jeff, and just a huge uh, thank you to the Jeff for su supporting PFPs. So as we get closer to this April launch for Enduring Earth, we invite countries, donors, local leaders, communities, and others to learn more, to join us in this effort. Come speak to me. I'll connect you with my colleagues if you're interested. And I think it's just one of the critical steps we can take to living in harmony with nature, like my family in Ilyinsky Pagost. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the conclusion of topic one. Hang with us. Everybody twist in your chair, just get a little movement, twist forward while we're getting ready, okay? Our next topic is on enhancing MPA coverage and performance. Um, you know, we have little time and we know we have a long way to go to get to whatever that goal is, 30% basically protecting the planet that we need to survive. So how do we do that, that we ensure these themes that we've heard about, that communities benefit, and really how do we design and implement for durable solutions. So that's what we're going to focus on. We're sorry to hear that Dr. Lubchenko is not able to join us and having difficulties. We'll circle back to Lauren if we have time. However, I realize that there's very little time left in this session and we will not have time at the end clearly for a question and answer. But please reach out to us. This is our favorite topic. So any of the panelists would love to hear from you. Um, so first, that I'd like to ask also by video, and I hope this works, if we can have Christina Laun, the head of Division for Environmental Policy, Urban Development, Mobility, Circular Economy, and Marine Conservation at BMZ, um, and is also the German representative to the Executive Board for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. Are you with us, Christina? Fantastic. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, do you hear me also in another way? We can hear you. There is some feedback. Please yeah, I, I do. I, I just try, I try to, to fade it out. Just please go ahead. We can hear you. Is that okay? Thank yes. You. Yes. Thank you very much. Is this really okay? Because I have. Oh. Sorry. Let's try a few sentences and see if the feedback gets better. If not, we may have to try again. Yes. So thank you very much. And mm. again, my commandment to have organized in a really outstanding way is um, in these very difficult times. And, um, Honestly, we also have a position to join you personally, but we are very happy to find all the virtual channels. Christina, so I'm so sorry. Yes? I'm so sorry. You have an idea. We are not able to really hear you. And so in a previous session, we offered and really the opportunity to have your remarks recorded and we can actually then share them out with all of the attendees and everyone who's joining us virtually. I, I apologize. I, I hope that that might be okay and we can do the same thing for Dr. Lubchenko. That way everybody can hear the clear comments because I'm sure you want to hear this happen. Would that be okay with you, Christina? I'm so sorry, we just can't hear you. I'm gonna take that as a yes. <laughs> um, these microphones are very low for me. <laughs> I think that was a yes. Um, so we're going to go with that um, and be optimistic. And we're going to try one more remote speaker. I know these technological um, connections are very difficult, and you have all experienced that for the last two years. So thank you for your understanding and patience. And we're going to turn 
actually now to Dr. Arthur, Arthur Tuda, who is the Executive Secretary for the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. And we'd really like you to dig a little bit deeper on science and your experience in Africa. Is Dr. Tuda with us remotely? We'll try this again. Yeah, thank you. Ah. Uh, hope you can hear me. We can. All right, thank you, and uh, greetings from Zanzibar. Uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, the science that we need for the MPAs that we want. And, uh, you know, uh, MPAs are important, as all the speakers have said. But uh, more importantly is how we design these MPAs, where we locate them, and how we manage them. And all this depends on the good science that we need to provide. So in the Western Indian Ocean region where we are, we try to promote uh, the use of good science to promote uh, connectivity as well as effective management. So we focus more on the natural, but, but also on the social sciences that tell us how to connect people, nature, and the marine protected areas. So my message today is that uh, science must expand to look at both ecology, people, land and sea interactions, so that we are able to get the MPs that we want. That's my message to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tuda. I think that sums it up so well So we're of the themes we've heard today. So we're going to switch gears and talk about the corporate sector. And without going into detail, because we don't have a whole lot of time, may I please introduce um, our next speaker, Celine. Um, Subron, I'm so sorry that I don't know how to speak French, from um, AXA Group. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'm the representative of uh, both the finance sector and the private sector in this panel. So just to say that uh, for the finance sector to, to take into account uh, what we call the, uh, the blue economy on the ocean into our investment and insurance decision is quite nascent. Uh, we have to be humble. But nevertheless, uh, I think that uh, like for climate change, um, we are more and more conscious that uh, the loss of nature will, uh, at the end, in the long run, imply uh, a, a loss of so also for our businesses. If we want to develop our economic activity, we have to rely on uh, um, healthy ecosystem services. So that, that's the uh, first thing I want to share with you. And we, were, we, we are more and more conscious of that. That's why we have created the Task Force for Nature-Related Disclosure, because in the finance sector or in the corporate sector if what you don't measure you don't pilot it so that why, why, why that's why we are we have created this uh, tnfd uh, on the model of the tcfd uh, to create a global framework of risk analysis of impact interdependencies of nature and we have create we are creating currently this global framework to disclose or a uh, risk on interdependency and impact on nature. So that, that's the first thing I want to share uh, with you today. And of course, uh, the, 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 the natural capital of the, uh, the ocean and the sea seas will, will be uh, taken into account. The second thing I want to share with you today is that uh, another way for us to protect the ocean and the seas, and notably the the, the protected area is also to be sure that we don't invest in project and we don't provide insurance uh, coverage to project which put an additional threat. To, to, the, to give you an example, AXA, but we are not alone in this movement, AXA has, has recently announced that we will stop investing or providing insurance coverage to project of Arctic drilling, for example. That's an example uh, we can give. So thank you for that. Yes, because it, it's a big uh, business effort. Huh? <laughs> we cut uh, from, uh, from, from uh, yes, from turnover, from insur insurance premium or on return on, on, on our investment. So, but uh, we consider that it's our indirect responsibility 
to 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 not uh, continue to to provide this type of investment on insurance coverage. Another thing I want also um, to to add to, um, to conclude that is intervention. We have uh, also a direct responsibility when we are able to provide insurance coverage for natural assets. So to give you an example, we have developed, notably to, uh, thanks to the research we made in the ORA, the Ocean Risk and Resilient Alliance, we are a member of this uh, uh, alliance, we have developed a product, an insurance product, uh, to protect coral reef, to protect mangrove, and when there is a natural disaster, uh, destroy this ecosystem, we are in capacity to provide a quick recovery for them, thanks to the technology of the satellites, but also thanks to what we call the parametric insurance based on a meteorological index, we provide a quick uh, payoff and uh, a financing to uh, restore uh, this ecosystem quickly b before it dies. So that's an example of what we can uh, do uh, to protect the ocean, but I will stop there because I'm conscious of the time. I know. Thank you so much. And we have three more topics. We are going to run into the break, so please hang with us because you're going to want to hear these calls to action. But on this um, topic of business, all of us who have been doing this for a while, like this is really new. And these are the kinds of novel um, engagement of the private sector that we need more and more. So I appreciate so much the last two things that have been shared about ways to finance and also ways to really bring private sector acumen into the work that we do. And speaking of that, that relates to technology and how can we use satellites to really understand and underscore. And actually there's going to be two speakers in a row that that's going to connect with. I'm going to start with you, uh, Clement um, Gallic who is uh, the co-founder and CEO at Unseen Labs. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the audience and be there. So yes, um, I guess I'm just going to, to say a few words, but uh, it will make echoes to everything that has been uh, said uh, already. We are talking about protecting the oceans. Of course, it's a matter of human beings first, but also a matter of um, co-working between private and public sectors and new technologies. Um, Private sectors uh, must be at the disposal of the government, states, uh, or small private companies, or small public, uh, public entities, to offer the new kind of technologies who can uh, bring new vision of uh, the uh, human activities at sea. At Unseen Labs, it's exactly what we developed. Uh, we are a satellite operator uh, with a new kind of technology which gives us the ability to have the real numbers of ships on an area of interest. It means the real, real human activity on some areas. So when you are speaking of MPAs, you have to monitor the uh, human activities and then to, uh, to monitor and to, uh, to, uh, to know the real human uh, uh, actions on these areas. Uh, so we are not the only one doing this kind of um, space observation dedicated to maritime surveillance, but we are a new layer of that. And what I, I'm going to say is that uh, now we are at a moment in the humanity, I guess it's maybe the, the first one, where ecology uh, has the same way and same path than uh, economic for some reasons. Uh, that's a uh, very good news for everyone. Um, we are mainly focused on maritime surveillance for illegal fisheries. And uh, major countries, all the, almost all of the countries, I have understood that if they don't protect their fisheries resources, they are putting endangering the, endanger their economy because their local fishers cannot work anymore. They must stay at home. They don't have enough money to feed their, their family and it brings a lot of complexity. So they know that if they spend some money in protection of their environment and maritime areas with public entities or private companies, it will directly bring them um, positive uh, movement for their local economy and uh, inhabitants. Um, that being said, uh, there is still a long way, uh, a lot to do, and uh, we are typically uh, on our personal point, we are a very small and very new company, only five years old, and uh, for the record, we are coming from Brittany, so we are here at home, let's say like that. Um, but um, I know a lot of new kind of people trying to invest time, uh, brain, and uh, power 
future in new kind of technology to to help the environment. It's maybe um, my generation a uh, new way to see work, but uh, but it's something positive we want to push. Um, and I will just finish uh, to say that we are not only working uh, to make business with uh, big states, big governments, but uh, I would like to salute the work of NGOs. Uh, I guess Tony from Global Film Watch will have a few words after that. It's the best representative, I guess, of the power of some engine NGOs can put uh, by using new kind of technologies. Uh, Global Film Watch use space technologies. Uh, uh, and uh, with some new technologies, brains and uh, willing human beings, uh, you can bring um, sharpened weapons to fight against uh, fisheries and to protect our oceans. So, uh, so far, so good, but uh, still a lot to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And if you can hear me, also thank you and to your community for hosting us here in Brest. I'm going to let that introduction of Tony Long from Global Fishing Watch to come and share an important call to action. Um, on how that technology is continuing to shape what we do. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that mention. The, the, the technology Unseen Labs has is, is truly groundbreaking, and uh, it's going to make some big differences in the future. You've heard the ocean is the least observed part of our planet. There's no global picture of human activity at sea, and therefore we cannot truly understand the impact on the ocean and the life below water. This lack of visibility and it means that illicit activity or damaging activity can thrive while we fail to govern because we cannot manage what we cannot measure. Our purpose at Global Fishing Watch is to create and publicly share knowledge about human activity at sea to enable fair and sustainable use of our ocean. Our cutting edge technology turns big data into actionable information. We share that information publicly and for free in order to accelerate the science, drive fairer and smarter policies and better practices that can reward good behavior out on the ocean and protect biodiversity, fisheries, livelihoods. And importantly, we can promote international cooperation through transparency of the ocean data to establish an era where every country has equal access to the latest data and the most innovative technologies. To help raise the ambition for marine protections global fishing watch and donna bertarelli philanthropy have partnered to develop global fishing watch marine manager it's a new technology portal to support the effective design management monitoring of marine protected areas the goal is to provide a comprehensive dynamic system of support for marine spatial planning scientific research and mpa design and it will support the ecological and economic effective of maritime marine protections around the world. The Marine Manager Portal is active now. The technology works. Our founding funders with the Government of Canada, with Donna Bertarelli, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the National Philanthropic Trust, have allowed us to initiate partners already in 16 different countries, including Galapagos, Ascension Island, Guyana, Nui, Tristan de Kuna, and within the Mediterranean Sea. Our partner country engagement is allowing us to understand more about their problems, to be able to develop marine manager to work how they need it to work. And Global Fishing Watch's contribution to this One Ocean Summit is to ensure that by the end of 2022, the marine manager portal will be fully integrated into the Global Fishing Watch map, scaled to the global level, and made available to all. Our call for action is to the heads of state to publish their information to Global Fishing Watch to support our work, promote collaboration throughout the, the planet, placing marine protections at the heart of national sustainable development strategies. Thank you. I don't know about you, but how many meetings have we gone to where the calls for action are aspirational? What I'm really encouraged by is these last two call for action and our last one is really about things that are already being proven. There may be in early days, but there are things that are already have momentum and have been prototyped. And that's really, we wanna see what's actually happening on the ground. Um, we have lots of commitments, but we wanna see action. So please, for our final call to action, Jerome, may I call you up here? Petite from the Pew, the, oh gosh. The, yeah, Pew Charitable Trust, but our, 
<laughs> what he said. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Jérôme Petit from the Pew Bertarelli Ocean Legacy. Thank you, Alani. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the ocean is in great danger. We've heard that uh, all over the day. There's no doubt about it, and this represents a growing risk uh, for our, not, not only for the marine ecosystems, but for the billions of people around the world who depend on a healthy ocean for their well-being and livelihoods. The IUCN, and they are, they are here in the room, <laughs> recommend that we strictly protect 30% of the planet's marine habitats to maintain the ecological benefits they provide. However, currently less than 3% of the world's oceans are fully or highly protected. So we are far off the mark. To accelerate the designation of new marine reserves, our organization, the Pew Charitable Trust, is honored to work in collaboration with Donna Bertarelli Foundation on the Pew Bertarelli Ocean Legacy Project, which seeks to promote the designation of highly uh, protected marine reserves around the world. So how do we work? We place ourselves in the position of facilitators. We support governments, local communities, scientists, mayors, fishermen who wish to protect their resources by giving them the technical assistance they need to design concrete MPA projects and identify consensus. From the waters of Hawaii to Palau, New Caledonia to Mexico, Easter Island, Tristan d'Acuna, Pitcairn, and many other sites, we have already helped safeguard nearly 8 million square kilometers of ocean. And we look forward to hearing other progress during this summit, hopefully in the French Southern Lands and French Polynesia on Friday. In a new phase of our partnership, we will continue to support the management of the reserves we help create because it is just a beginning to create uh, an MPA. But we also want to focus on three new regions, the Eastern Tropical Pacific area in Central America, the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, and the Mediterranean. Working alongside decision makers and actors in the field, we want to advocate in these regions a whole ocean approach, recognizing the important connections between wildlife, marine habitats, and peoples. In other words, connect to protect. Thanks again to the organizers for this inspiring workshop, which shows that the 30 by 30 target is achievable. We can count on our, you can count on our mobilization, and we count on the decision makers to make this goal a reality. Thanks again. We've heard a lot about Costa Rica all day today, but also three times in this session alone. And so to bring some remote energy into the room and also add to the announcement of what organizations are already doing, we have Carlos Manuel Rodriguez coming in from Costa Rica, who is the CEO of the Global Environment Facility. My friend, are you on with us? Uh, thank you, uh, Lani. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. The, and, uh, I, I would like to begin by saying that um, one of the most beautiful things I ever done in my life was uh, diving with uh, Cynthia Earl in 2004 in Cocos National Park. Uh, Cocos is this remote island in the middle of the eastern uh, tropical Pacific. And uh, after diving uh, that day, uh, Cynthia told me, Carlos Manuel, without the blue, there won't be any green. And uh, that has a huge impact uh, in me and my work that I did in Costa Rica. My work that I did in Conservation International and nowadays uh, at, uh, at the GF. And uh, it is relatively sad to think that um, we had a great opportunity to level the effort of protecting the oceans and the land in terms of keeping progress with the HG target number 11. Unfortunately, we were short of getting to the 10% marine protection by 2020. Nevertheless, uh, there is a true momentum, there's political will, the science is there for do um, huge progress in the next uh, decade. And as you know, we need to protect at least, at least 30% of the ocean in this uh, next uh, decade. In that context, the JF plays huge important work in supporting all countries in their effort to uh, protect 
heavy erosion. And um, if we, if marine protected areas are delivered on multiple benefits, then it is crucial that we find ways to support both site selection and long-term support for existing and new NPA. Is investing in both national and regional planning and governance processes while finding ways to direct scale new public and private funds towards effective long term uh, uh, functioning of NPAs. And a couple of things are important to highlight as good examples. Uh, uh, Masha explained us of uh, Enduring Earth and what Enduring Earth is aiming for the next day at least. You, Lani, you've been helping us with the Blue Nature Alliance, with uh, together with uh, Pew, um, uh, Meet the Rules Foundation, the Waltons, uh, CI, and the Jeff. We're aiming to protect at least one two point fifteen hectares of the oceans by 2025. I mean, these uh, alliances will give countries the needed resources and technical support uh, to get to that 30% by 2030. And then on, 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 in terms of mobilizing financial mechanisms and be very innovative in finance, I think that the work that um, uh, Jeff has done with the government of G, uh, Seashell is very interesting because of the uh, first debt swap for ocean conservation and the first uh, sovereign the blue bond. Mm -hmm. Those examples are done uh, with the government of uh, Seashells are a great um, example of how we can mobilize funding in a way that can guarantee the uh, long-term sustainability of those MPAs. Looking forward to Jeff, in our Jeff age cycle, we plan to invest at least $120 million to support marine species planning and marine protection. It will be um, the way by which we can collaborate uh, advancing with the national blue economy planning processes. Thank you so much, um, Aldani. Um, Thank you so much, my friend. You know, this theme of partnerships and alliances, real ones, right, not the kind that we don't talk about anymore, are more important than ever. And these calls to action are all examples of the importance of coming together as organizations and as, as, and as nations, really, to do this work. And so it's been wonderful. And to close this session, we are really honored to have Dr. Bruno Ur Ur Oberle, sorry, I'm so bad at this, um, Director General of IUCN, to really share some closing remarks on the importance importance of this topic. Are, are we there? Oh, is Mina here? Ah, are you sharing? Come here, Mina. A surprise guest. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished your excellencies. Um, I'm Mina Epps. I'm here on behalf of IUCN. Unfortunately, our Director General Bruno Oberle could not be here, so I am indeed your surprise guest speaker, and I will try. <laughs> so this, uh, this summit really came about um, in Marseille when, uh, so we want to congratulate uh, President Emmanuel Macron for his leadership in announcing the One Ocean Summit to be held here in Brest, and here we are. So thank you very much for taking that initiative. Um, it's actually one of first of many many important steps towards taking action to really stop the decline of ocean health this year. So it's a major milestone, so let us hope it meets the ambition. Um, restoring ocean health is one of IUCN's um, key priorities, which is also endorsed by our members through the many resolutions that's been passed. And they range from everything from um, tackling, tackling plastic pollution, a call, for a moratorium on deep sea bed mining, to protection on the high seas, to come out with a real ambigu um, ambitious and proof, um, proof, future proof treaty, but also to protect the 30% of the ocean, which is really what we have been hearing here today, from the science to all the way through insurance companies and the breadth of it. So uh, let me try to summarize that and define success. Um, we need to enhance MPA coverage and performance, but ultimately we want to make sure, what I've heard, is that it works for nature and people, and especially those really directly depending on them. Um, it's of particular importance for the communities, but also let us not forget the high seas. We are all connected because of this one ocean, so let the marine protected areas be that connectivity. 
Um, governance and effective management, we've heard, are key, um, especially in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Sorry, this is a bit short. Um, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Oh, there's, you can... <laughs> Um, so we actually heard that, and we can actually optimize this by using artificial intelligence um, technology and also to access and analyze big data in a cost-effective way. So I'm looking at Tony here. Um, but in, so in, in, in the light of cost-effectiveness, um, we are dependent on multilateral um, development funds, so such as Jeff, but also together with blended finance, so private financing as well. Uh, and that's essential to tackle all these challenges. But today's session took a broader look at all this and how we can do it. And I had a few examples, which I don't actually have, have time to mention, but there were examples of how you can integrate the blue economy and marine protected area, which we are doing in many places of the world together with our members. Uh, and that's ranged from uh, you know, Mexican waters uh, to across the world, all parts of the world's ocean. So in terms of uh, concluding that we may need 30% of highly protected areas for, for the most benefit, but we definitely, we might even need additional 20% as a climate refugia, but nonetheless, we still need 100% sustainable use. So that is what we're aiming for. And we haven't heard much, but they've also mentioned of other effective uh, conservation measures, OECM. So we invite you to look at the IUCN guidelines and definitions of those. So in conclusion, the ocean is fundamental to our survival and we must be conserved. So on that, I would like to invite everyone here, all our friends, all the speakers, to join us in Vancouver in September for the IMPACT, IMPACT 5, the International Marine Protected Area Congress, to really pave out the roadmap on how to get to 2030. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. You have all been wonderful and very patient. Um, the organizers and all of us are going to put a white paper together. We'll circulate that through as many channels as we can, put some contact details so you can collect all this information and continue to have this conversation. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Before you leave, before you leave, I want you all to give a big applause to Oleni, who has done a fantastic job. It has been tough to, to manage and conduct this. Extraordinary. We learned. <laughs> Don't give the Polynesian the job of keeping on time. I would just like to ask uh, MP uh, Frédéric Tufnel, Madame la députée, pour une petite voix française, une grande voix française, pour dire un mot. I would say that maybe uh, to quote Ambassador Peter Thompson, stop the decline, you would say, uh, arrêtez le déclin. Mais avec vous, c'est aussi une invitation à... à comme partagé pendant tout cet après-midi, à, à s'engager davantage avec rationalité. Et, et on ne connaît que ce qu'on mesure. Et nous avons appelé nos propres mesures. Et des sens de mesure. Merci, mesdames, messieurs. Merci beaucoup. Juste pour conclure, je vais parler en français, dire un petit mot en français. Je voudrais vous dire que. On est tous embarqués sur ce grand bateau qui tend aujourd'hui sur l'océan. On est tous embarqués et on ne sait pas, on tire un rideau, le rideau bleu de l'océan, sans savoir ce qui se passe à l'intérieur. On a besoin aujourd'hui de connaître, et comme vous l'avez dit, on connaît bien, quand on, on connaît bien, quand on connaît bien, on protège bien. Et eh bien, c'est ainsi qu'il faut le, le prendre. Moi, je retiens de cette journée énormément de choses qui ont été dites. Nous avons les clés de l'avenir, nous avons la solution. Il faut absolument que tous les pays s'engagent, peut-être dans une charte commune de classification des aires marines protégées qui soient identiques, parce que ça, nous ne l'avons pas encore. Peut-être aussi sur ce que je prône depuis quatre ans à l'Assemblée nationale en tant que parlementaire, la technique des trois A, je vous l'ai dit, anticipation, adaptation et acceptabilité sociale. Et c'est ça, ces trois éléments, ces trois A qui doivent aussi nous guider pour essayer d'obtenir justement dans chaque pays eh bien, une, 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 une air, des aires marines protégées qui soient effectives et pas des aires marines protégées de papier. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Could you say that in English? The three A's. The three A. The three A. It's anticipation, adaptation, acceptability, social acceptability. Because nothing is new can succeed if you don't have the acceptability of the people, of the you know all the people in, over the world, you know near the sea. Because it's as you said, we have only one ocean. 
and we have to be all of us in, in the same movement to accept the